digital expert at PA Consulting and Professor of Practice in Information Systems Management at the Warwick Business School. Mark, come on down. We'll get you mic'd up. You. You're right behind me. Great. So Mark is a, a, an accomplished business technology leader who has worked uh, for many Fortune 500 companies uh, in over 20 countries and uh, in both pu public and private sectors. And his work at PA involves leadership in innovation and digital strategy for digital platforms. So good follow on. So Mark will be telling us about uh, Continuing on from Chris's idea, uh, the battle for ownership of, of owning the digital spaces. So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, David. I uh, hope you can hear me. I'm just recovering from a Christmas cold. I don't know if anybody's had the same type of bug. Hopefully I won't leave it with San Francisco. But uh, uh, thank you very much for having this opportunity to talk. I've been involved with the Open Group for, um, since 2010, working closely, particularly with, with uh, Chris and uh, with David and a few others. And obviously, thank you again to uh, Alan Brown for many things that you've created with this organization. Um, what I want to do is talk about um, this thing called digital. It's currently, I would say, the current flavor of the month or flavor of the year. We'll probably go on to the Internet of Things, cyber, cyber intelligence next year, whatever. Um, I have more slides than I've got time, so I'm going to go fairly quickly. I have some props and I have a demo. So I kind of set myself quite a high target, but hopefully this will be entertaining. I will not apologize, but I have quite uh, content-rich slides. It's my kind of method I like with my students. I will leave you with stuff. I've got two books if you want to read about it, etc. Shameless plug. Um, but anyway, let's just go with it. So the concept that I want to talk about is really three areas. One is there's this concept of what we call the battle for owning digital experience or digital spaces. We're starting to see, uh, certainly in the UK, and we're seeing it elsewhere, either you physically feel it or you sense something's going on, where I mean, in the retail market, for example, they will sell you a product or service, and then they would sell you something add-on, and then there'll be adjacent services, and then before they know where you know where you are, you're kind of locked into a kind of relationship. And what's happening there is this, this sort of uh, what I call digital land grab for your mind, mindset, your experience, your customer journey. The second thing I want to talk about is show some examples of where companies are actually starting to succeed at doing this. Whether this is by design or by, by action or thing, then I just want to talk about some of the things. There's a very famous phrase by one of the professors I have the privilege of knowing. He's actually over in Temple University here, but he's an associate with our faculty, where he talks about competition has gone to the ecosystem. What he means by that, that when you talk about competition, it's between, say, Android and iOS. that is starting to raise in clusters, and you're kind of competing in that level of ecosystem architecture, if you will. The third thing I want to talk about is really what are the lessons, what are the key things that we want to start to think about. This is really the reason that Chris has just introduced uh, the Digital Business and Customer Experience Work Group at the Open Group. I urge you, I'm slightly biased because I was one of the co-founders of this, but what we're trying to do is not throw the baby out of the bathwater and say, well, enterprise architecture is dead, long live enterprise architecture, this version, is trying to understand how do we move from a to use some phrase I've had in PA, a information technology portfolio mindset, which is very good. You have to manage assets and interactions of your cost of, of operation. But how do you create agility into the outside in thinking and things like that? So it's starting to think about models and capabilities. And some of these things, as you know, are actually not within the domain of your control. A lot of this is being done to you through the ecosystem channels. So what I want to do is start to move fairly quickly, if this thing will work quickly. We live in an era of unprecedented uh, growth. I don't know if I've gone on too far. Let me just feel free. We need to understand really the realities of consumerization. We understand the realities of industrialization, in, uh, Industry 4.0, the Fraunhofer Institute. Recently, I was involved in some um, lecturing at uh, Nottingham University in the UK, where we started to think about digital manufacturing, connected supply chain, connected products, connected assets, the other aspects of what we call the society of things and the industry of things. How do the two universes work together? What's happening is we're living in this world of exploded information. I mean, it's just a, a phrase that I've used there. What happens in one digital second? I think at the time that we've been running this morning, what, just over an hour, there has been millions, if not billions, of transactions. Sometimes I feel they're going through my personal uh, in, in, inbox and my email at times. But there are the, the plethora of information out there on the internet is really both a threat 
as well as an opportunity. And the era that we're moving into, when I talk to some economists, uh, particularly in some of the city, smart city work I do, you have to think of it as a kind of um, feedback loop, loop, if you will. What we're living in is not a static data environment. We're actually living in a world where we have to think about usage data. A great quote from Hootsuite said, 31% of traffic in an enterprise is social. Well, let me think for a minute, what does that mean? I mean, 70% is transactional master databases, but what's the 30%? Oh, well, that's stuff where people are talking, talking internally, talking externally. There's money in that data. There's money in those white spaces. Or, well, to use a real cliche, I wanted to try and get David Bowie into this presentation somehow. He, I don't know if you've seen the video. In 1999, he gets interviewed by a BBC, a well known BBC journalist, and he said, It's about the grey space. I won't try and mimic his voice. It's the grey space between the performer and the audience, you create this performance. And this is very much a mindset you start to think if you understand digital artwork and digital performance, that is exactly in the era that we're in. What I find amazing, apart from if you either love or hate David Bowie, he figured that out in 1999. Amazing guy. You see the video, it's really good. So following that, which I can't, in terms of where we are now, is that what we're finding is that the reported data around the Internet of Things, or rather the e-commerce around uh, GDP, the realities are, and you see this time and time again, I saw this in Barcelona last year at the Mobile World Congress, is that we're starting to see what I call a triple helix. We're seeing that the reported e-commerce transactions is around 20 30%. But we know, we see people looking at their laptops and they're interacting, and hopefully are listening to what I'm talking about, I'm sure. They're starting to interact at a much higher percentage rate of doing stuff. You can quote many surveys now where, what, we've got about 29 apps on our mobile phone at least. We spend, I've read, one to two hours a day looking at the screen, the mobile screen. We start to interact in a much more cyber digital way. So what's happening here is that we're kind of seeing this drift towards a kind of new reality. We're starting to see, if you look at the numbers around the estimated size of these markets now, the one I find interesting, which is a kind of a paradigm, if you study fintech, I just had a large event I, I ran in the Shard in London last week around discussing fintech with the UK government as well as different technology startups and innovators. They say, well, uh, Bitcoin is starting, but we don't think it will go anywhere, is one camp. The other camp is saying, hang on a minute, we're changing the way the digital bank works. We're changing the way automatic payments are happening. We're changing the way, and a great phrase from uh, a well-known um, credit card company is say, I see 50 billion objects, or actually I see 50 billion points of sale. The hairs on the back of my neck start to rise and say, what do you mean? 50 billion points of sale, but surely it's not all about money. This is like trying to tell the, excuse my phrase, the Pope to change religion. Clearly, no, it is all about the money. It's all about the transaction. But then you get into other types of debates that we're doing with Cambridge University and elsewhere where it's about your personal data. Is, is it your, their right to use your data? Should you own the privacy and value of that data? And can you monetize that data? You start to get into those ethical debates that are starting to break out now. So there's lots of money to be had in this environment. There's lots of things that we need to think about. We need to think about the effect of digitization. Digitization is an academic term in papers. But the phrase, as you can probably imagine, moves on quite quickly. What I see when you think about nanotechnology or bio, bio chips or other sort of leading edge new technologies breaking, we're starting to talk about the technological embeddiment, if there is a word, with a source of products and services and experiential computing that's starting to happen now with the Internet of Things. So what we're seeing, another uh, graph that says we're on a, a trajectory that's going up, is that what we're finding is, that to put this summarise, is to say you have a digital experience where you have a new mobile app. But the trouble is you then operate in a world where you have the consumer or the user having lots of other apps to choose from. And the question you have to ask yourself is, well, if I build this platform, will they come? If I build this mobile phone, will it scale? How do I do scaling, mechanisms for scaling, innovation, adoption, and things like that? Very interesting research area at the moment, which I could talk about at another, at another time. But what we find is that the question is, how do you get from the macro to the micro? How do you create this thing and then create this resonance with a community? You get viral feedback loops. They start to iterate and consume more, more content, create more generated content, and it goes into a spiral, right? And this spiral grows and grows and grows. And what you start to get is the impact on the actual wider economy. 
Now, when I talk about the small and the large happening together, that is what I call ecosystem thinking, because you can't architect in one space because it impacts on the wider space. And then the wider space, call it regulation, then impacts on the way the small space works. It's ecosystem thinking. It's joined up thinking. So what's happening now is that we've got to think about the fine-grained spaces. The two big dimensions that I sort of see is really along the bottom there is we're starting to see this ability to take your, mat, your, your WAN and LANs, or your LANs and WANs, and you're starting to see the municipal networks starting to spread out across cities, but then you're starting to get much more fine-grained network capability, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, near-field communication then starting to get some stuff which I'm going to demonstrate in a minute. We're starting to use very, very fine-grained information about locations, micro-location technology. It gives you a higher level of precision. It gives you an ability to do things that 10 years ago you can just only imagine. And what this means is we're not actually architecting products and services. A great phrase from a colleague from Huawei earlier, which I admire, was he said, loyalty is not about products and services. Loyalty is about uh, the experience. Loyalty is to the ecosystem. It's loyalty to the community that you belong to. That is what's turning the millennials or the, the Generation Z people particularly into new consumers of the future today. It's about owning the spaces, owning the wearables, owning the smart digitization of that experience and feedback mechanisms. So what's happening is that we need to really think about what does it mean to be an enterprise? What does it mean to be a product or a service? The realities are that this, this itself is actually a platform. This is the enterprise. There is a reversion, an inversion of what it means to be a product. That's a completely different mindset. A completely different mindset. And the architecture has to change in the sense of how does that ecosystem work. A slide that I use occasionally with some clients, and this tends to resonate, is that your business is the thing on the left, you perceive yourself as one big brand, but in reality, you've got lots of little, little products and services going on inside your organization. You are, a, to use the phrase, disintermediated or reintermediated, or whatever other word you want to use. The reality to the consumer is you look like that on the right-hand side, but that you perceive yourself as on the left-hand side. What does that mean? What it means is you have to start to think about proxy services. You have to think about where am I going to put my platforms, where do I need to play in order that people don't get traffic being directed off to our competitors or information that I'm providing is being used by over-the-top services to monetize and start to eat into some of the growth and opportunity that I want. Or you get a disconnected experience with the consumers. You're not really reaching them, you're not making more of the moment when they're there. So what's happening is really this idea that I've introduced in my books but also around the sort of research and client work I've done at PA Consulting, is that we need to think about architecture in a different way. The academics talk about, here we go, spatial temporal transformation. I've just put my teeth in to just to say that properly. And what they mean by that is that the spatial connections in spaces are starting to, to decompose and connect through digital processes. Temporal, it means that everything is a physical moment, but also can be a virtual moment. You can live past experiences because you can play them back in real time. I was just looking, playing last night uh, with the New York Times virtual reality app. Have you tried that one? You can download a, a virtual app, a virtual reality app, and start to live the experience of being on the plane or being in a, in a movie. You can move the phone around. You can start to create the immersive experience in the physical space, but repeated virtually. And then you can put a multiplier around that because you can be repeated and replicated for all the people in the room. An amazing type of reinvention of, of experience. So what we have is a thing called um, nested modular architecture, to use the phrase. Nested modular arch architecture is this idea that you can have various levels of objects and assets. The body, the human body itself, is a set of subsystems, of course. This is measuring my heart rate at the moment. I've got a device there that's measuring my carbon monoxide, not my personal carbon monoxide output, uh, but also measuring the carbon monoxide space where I'm living right now. I can then connect to the room. This could be a smart room. It could be a smart building, a smart facility, a smart city, a smart connected experience between this city and the airport, this airport to another place in another country. 
you start to get this connected society, connected industries, the connected ecosystem, the connected economy. That's the big architecture picture, isn't it? They would fill a wall. Well, do we really want to do that? I've had death by 5,000 uh, use cases before. Everybody put their hand up who's had that before. Probably will put their hands up. You know what I mean. Don't go there. So the issue around this is really, typically, within a 24-hour day, very little is actually transactional when you're doing stuff. I need to buy something or doing stuff. You're actually really experiencing life. You're connecting your usage. You're wanting to get what I call soft big data or small data to start to collect information that actually matters at the moment and things I'm doing all the time. I'm not always transacting a transaction from a banking sense. What happens is you start to think about the 24 hours in the day. You're sleeping for eight hours, a bit of a joke in my case. Or you're actually working for eight hours. Again, another joke in my case, I'm sure us as well. You start to do other things. You can start to think about what is the white space where I'm actually doing other things that I'd like to have lifestyle services, augmented capabilities. But how do I build that? How do I own the spaces? Because that is what I really want. I don't want to be distracted by yet more marketing. I want to opt into the services that I actually want to be distracted about. So the realities are that we're finding that, to use the phrase of Tesla cars or others, very famous examples, we're always connected. You're continually connected. What it means that objects and people are always connected, and it can create a new kind of architectural reality. Another quick diagram is we're starting to get this phrase called um, vertical scaling, where we're starting to use multiple screens. I can look, look at the TV, I can go onto my watch, I can go onto my mobile phone, I can go onto my iPad, I can go onto the smart walls with adverts, live adverts on those walls. We're starting to get multiplicity of interaction points with smarter appliances as they become digitized. We start to then think about the lifestyle of the working spaces, the living space, the cultural space, the society space, the transit space, the living space, the commercial spaces, the spatial transformations that this capability enables you to think about. That's a slightly different way of thinking about your TOM, your target operating model. It is you need the cost model of your operation, but how does it physically re-enable itself if it can then be broken up and connected through a digital supply chain? What's the language that we need to put in place to enable us to reverse the thinking sometimes about we build a product and then it moves to how do I connect these things in a collaborative way? So as I said, it's a temporal spatial transformation. It's a rather uh, difficult phrase to use, but what it essentially means, to use the other phrase that economists and you've hopefully read before, is it's flattening out. It's not like the founder of Sun Microsystems who once said the internet will flatten out, or cloud computing will flatten out the internet. What's happening now is we're getting flattening out industry and society. We're getting connected space and connected devices. We need to think about this, the addressability of those spaces. Some services, just a study, I think it was an event just down the road in Palo Alto, said that customers who opt in to specific micro-location services, you can get up to an 80% conversion rate with those cons uh, consumers. That's a big number that any marketing person say, oh, I'll have some of that. I'm not talking about programmatic marketing, I'm talking about something beyond that which is starting to say, I actually am connected with you. you have, I understand your identity. I understand your personal space and needs. I understand where you are within the context of this event and room. I'm actually trying to augment your experiences in a positive way for both parties. So what we need to think about is we need to really understand what is going on. We need to think about the virtual marketplace, the, the, the verticalization, the horizontalization. We started to see lots of early movers in this space. I won't go through all of those, but if you start to look at this map, you start to see on the um, left-hand side, bottom, um, connected appliances starting to happen. It's not quite there, but if you look at Google smart home devices, you start looking at the car battlefield that's starting to break out. You start to look at Bosch, Siemens, GE, Intel. You start to look at what they're trying to do in terms of smart appliances and integration. We're starting to see this thing kind of spreading, not like a virus, but spreading across other sectors and starting to create this kind of integrated experience. You can have all these slides, by the way. 
we find that what's happening is that we need to think about the value chain. I mean, Porter's Five Forces, Porter's Value Chain, circa 1985. I always have a go at the academics about this. But come on, guys, that was 1985, and you're still using it in 2016. Now, <laughs> what's going on? I think we need a new language to describe a new ecosystem. I would argue that I think the open group, and this is me putting my flags on the masters, I think is a well placed to create that language because it needs to think about a, not, not everything has to be open, but it needs to think about a trend, a, a, a connected space of boundaries. How do these things work together? So I can put my hand up and say, I don't think our work's completed yet. We've got more work to do. So what we're starting to think about, and I quite like this slide because I spent quite a lot of time doing this, and hopefully this gives you a nice visual. Somebody's had clearly had too much time on the flight for, for 11 hours. But what I'm trying to demonstrate there, the out of home experience, can be connected with the connected work experience, with the connected retail. I personally quite like this slide for a lot of reasons, because I think this is what's going on in 2016. You're getting vertical proxy services. I can do stuff without even moving from my chair in my front room. I can buy stuff, I can interact with my work, and then I can do things horizontally. I can start to connect things, I can start to own the smart home experience. I can take the home from home experience. I can go and sit in my hotel and reimagine the interaction of my Xbox environment or whatever in the workspace or in the hotel space. It can follow me. It's a different mindset. You start to invert the concept of what does it mean to be digital. You can take the digital space with you. So what's happening is you're starting to see a battleground. This is the thesis of the, of the argument. Um, you start to see, and this is just an example of consumer products. If you're in engineering, this is different, I know, but it's the same concept, sort of. You're starting to see lots of appliances trying to get into position so that when you're actually touching this thing, it's actually interacting, it knows who you are. You're starting to use mobile devices, you're starting to try and use connected intelligence and stands behind it to actually aggregate and use that information in a smart way. I love the earlier commentary about am I talking to a dog or a computer AI that Chris, Chris Harding was talking about earlier. It probably was a dog, Chris. I, it might have been AI, I don't know. But <laughs> um, so the question around this, and I'm seeing this with a number of clients now, is that you can either just stand still and say, oh, that looks interesting. Well, we're collecting all the big data. I'm sure something will turn up. Not always talking like that, of course. But typically what they find is they're in silos because they're in a physicality of their organization. But what digital does is it breaks those boundaries down. It starts to think about how do I need to take this information and interact in a different way? How do I need to build platforms or services that people can buy into and get scaling and iterative generative value? This term that academics use called generativity. It's a very good phrase. It's about self-generativity, about applied generativity. So what we're finding is that there's a battle for, here's an example of the thermostat, but actually there's loads of brands. What does a brand mean in the digital world? It doesn't really exist, does it? <clears throat> does a brand protect you? Is it a fig, a fig leaf, a loincloth? You, know, you can whip it away because what happens is you have a couple of things here. You have an interoperability challenge. Was it Nest recently declared that then you're not allowed to use non-standard APIs to connect to it? I know one of the professors at Cambridge University Computer Department said something quite colourful on his Facebook page at that particular point when that was announced, which I will spare you the blushes of explaining what he said. But you can guess what happened. But that's the whole point. How do you connect this experience to the person who's actually using this, to the environment, to the place? Brands and systems are multiplying, but what we're finding is that industry need to think in a different way. They need to think in joined up spaces. We need to think about the standards involved in it. It's not the only thing I know, but it's about trying to create connectivity to join up the experiences. So, a couple of really three examples. If you look at, say, as I said, the smart home, there's some common themes starting to happen, and hopefully we will collect this in the, in the work group. They establish a B2C website. They start to think about selling categories as bundles, not as products. They start to think about, well, what can I do that adjacent services? I've sold you a fridge or a, or a cooker. Can I sell you the home insurance on top of that? I start to create lifestyle brands. I start to then own the experience with you and your connected home. Smart travel, my favorite, the Tesla car. If only I had one, I'd love to own one. 
The clever thing about Tesla cars is they're continually connected. And when they leave the show, they continue to innovate and improve with software updates. The recent one is it parks itself. This is an improvement on a product that's already left the building, but it's still being upgraded as you're driving around in it and learning information as you go around. Disney. Disney, love them to bits, they barcode your children. I don't think that's a very good phrase to use, probably in an open forum. But the point I'm making, it's not, a, it's not a fair reflection of what they're doing. What they're doing is they're creating an excellence in being able to monitor where things are around the park. And I love it, it's a kind of goldfish bowl or an ecosystem example of what a connected ecosystem truly could be like. You just think about what you do when you're going around a, an amusement park. You get advice around queuing, it tell you where it's going on, where the food is, and it's all very, very personal, isn't it? Why isn't the work experience like that? Why isn't your lifestyle at home like that? Why isn't your gym membership like that? But it could be. So what's happening here is you've got to think about a compelling case for doing this. You've got to start to think about how am I going to take us on this journey? What do I need to build as architects? This is an architecture forum, obviously. So the lesson I'm taking away from this is you need to think about convenience and new experience. You need to think about upselling and cross-selling and building lifestyle services, connected spaces. You need to think about protecting your brand space. Now, why does Apple cars and Google make questionable, uh, make, make an issue for Ford and Jaguar Land Rover and BMW? Why are they doing this? Well, it's because it's a brand space, guys. That's what it's about. And it's moving around. It is a, basically a mobile phone on four wheels. It is a platform on four wheels. And it's also creating that ownership. It's a totally joined up experience. It's following the customer before they've even thought about the love of phrase at Hilton Hotel, Geraldine Carpenter had a digital. She said, we start with a dream. We start with the dream of the customer dreaming to go on vacation. That's the point of the customer journey we start at. Not when they're in through the door about customer acquisition or when they just left and take them and send them the bill. It's the total life cycle. The ecosystem experience joined up. So we need to think about some hard choices. We need to think about, in my recent work with a, 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 an airport in the UK, he's saying, if I build this stuff, how do I know people will come? Because there's so much distraction going on. What we're finding is that we're starting to see various different architectures starting to happen. These are just four examples, not the only example. If you look at Volvo or GM, they're starting to, GM invested, I'm told, 18 months in building their own in-car management system and they, you can get the same system, navigation system, on an open Android site. Why do you need to build the platform? Why don't you just go and buy, get one from an open source and then add things to it? Coordinator platform, the Uberization effect. How do we get connected lifestyles? Well, what we could do is start to do crowdsourcing of information to share anonymously in most cases. It's another type of platform, the coordinator platform. That's what an Uber platform is. <coughs> Modular architecture for Industry 4.0. We've all heard this phrase that a car, 40% of a car will be software in a couple of years' time, or cost-wise. Another one is the data orchestrator, the connected finance. Back to my point, 50 billion objects is actually 50 billion points of sale. So what are companies doing about this? What are we actually trying to do? There are several transformational effects that are starting to happen. There is a shift in the way we need to think about products and services and costs and revenue. This is something a colleague of mine, Rob Mettler at PA, is talking about. He says this phrase, we're not in Kansas anymore, obviously we're in San Francisco today. <laughs> but this concept is you kind of have to think differently. Time has shrunk, touch points have started to become live and interactive. Physical environments and virtual environments are connected. The processing power, I mean, a, a favorite phrase of mine, I was actually invited to go and do a supercomputing workshop, as you do in Vienna last year, with the, uh, Greg, I didn't make this up, Greg Mendel Institute for Biological Research. And it was amazing for the price point, the sort of computing power that you can get now. And that's an extreme, extreme uh, scale. But how do you bring that massive power to a laser point? That is what is happening now. Behavior is changing. Data's opening up. We've got lots of examples that we've done in PA. 
Um, well, I use this diagram a lot, but I, I'm just going to just run this quickly past you. Is you have to think about the shift. I did this with cloud computing. Obviously, there's a time compression. With cloud computing, you can go from days or rather weeks and months to acquiring something to literally minutes. But what's happening with digital, it's almost like the next level of connection and performance management. We're getting rapid utility computing combined with greater sensitivity in customer experience. You can scale faster because you can create additive effects. You can innovate faster because you can source things. You don't always have to, to use Timothy Chu's uh, famous book of seven about software as a service. You don't have to buy the cow anymore. You can just go and buy the milk. You can then go and combine the milk with various things, milk milkshakes or whatever other things. It's composable. There's lots of different dimensions that are showing us that we could start to transform the very speed and experience of business and, and, and lifestyles. Here's another example of platform-centric thinking. I won't go on in the famous poster, Charles. A great video on the YouTube, you know, The Four Horsemen. If you've seen it, if you haven't seen it, Google it, The Four Horsemen, watch it. It's a brilliant um, movie, I would describe it, of Facebook, Google, Amazon, and, uh, and um, how they're actually working to transform the way their platforms become the platform of choice. You look at Netflix, you look at Uber, you look at Stripe. They're fundamentally changing the sort of architectural paradigm, right? I like this example, the airport challenge, being a sort of an educational person part-time, I said, I've noticed there's a problem that I call the airport challenge. We've got people coming into the airport. This is a paradigm and a, a sort of a model for, for everything in digital. We've got people coming into the airport and they want to get through the airport as quickly as possible and they want to get their food and they just want to get their bags on the plane and they want to get on the plane and they want to go somewhere and they don't want to be delayed. So they have a relationship with the airline that they're flying with, not with the airport. They just want to use the service, the infrastructure. But the infrastructure, the airport, has all of the duty free. It has all the facilities, it has the car parks, it has the added value services that it wants to improve your experience going through the airport. And the airlines themselves, where they're sort of competing with, with attention for each of the customer services, but they're also by proxy using the infrastructure the airport is providing. What you're finding is you have this kind of triangular problem that you see time and time again with digital. You have customers who have relationships with other providers who necess don't necessarily have the relationship with the infrastructure that they're using. It's over-the-top services in telecoms. It's smart city services that are being given by um, you know, partner services from industry. You see it time and time again of how do you cross this Rubicon of ag aggregated data and services when you don't actually own the direct relationship with a customer. But if I, as a customer, was subscribing to the airport, that I wanted to get a better experience going through, that they knew who I was or anonymously identified who I was, you could start to think about different digital services and a kind of win-win-win scenario could unfold. That's my expectation. At the moment, we have this kind of demand supply model, which is kind of overcompensating. That has a cost to it which is kind of saying, well, we don't have any people around the airport. We sort of know the numbers of people coming through. We obviously track them for passports and stuff. We'll have this number of ground staff, we have this number of cleaners, we'll have this kind of number of stuff. They plan for a certain aggregated demand level, but it's not really fine-tuned. But if you use the Internet of Things, you know how many people are going where and what they're doing. You can start to reduce the total cost of operation because your ability to visualize and see what's going on is better. It's a different mindset you have to have in digital thinking. My prop. This is something in the UK which has uh, recently been um, just launched uh, this month that PA Consulting are involved in. This is a carbon monoxide uh, monitor. And uh, what's the clever thing about it is it monitors your personal carbon monoxide space. You take it around with you. The clever thing is called a uh, free vault, which is a, a TM. It just basically uh, has no battery, it uses the Wi Fi and GSMA frequencies to ge generate energy for itself and then this is a low energy Bluetooth connection with my mobile phone. I went running around San Francisco yesterday in my vain attempt to try and remain healthy which is a, a, an added battle which is another, another lecture for another time. What you can do here is you can start to collect and crowdsource and share this information and you can start to use gamification to try and encourage me to go on low carbon monoxide trips. I can save money or generate money. It starts to grow awareness of where everything is. It starts to show you your lifestyle. 
And I would say this is a kind of the triangular thing. You've got the cloud computing thing, you've got the mobile app, you've got the Internet of Things device, and they're connected. And they're starting to work in synergy, and then around the space is the actual carbon oxide or the sustainability of the ecosystem around it. You see the power of that. That is the power of the Internet of Things, is the power of the digital thinking that you can start to bring into, into the fore. So what we're having here, as I said, is a tag. Uh, it's using different technologies. Uh, it's got the usual mobile apps that uh, go with it. And it's got innovative stuff. What PA Consulting did is we're actually involved in building some of the software coding that actually works with this. The actual sensor and the free vault is intellectual property. It's the IP of uh, uh, Drayston Technologies, a UK startup company. When you think of the power that this could do, if you can start to get Bluetooth connections of sensors that don't need batteries, what else could you measure? Not just carbon monoxide, you can measure other things. Well, what could you do with that? Oh, well, lots of other things. It's here today. How do I think about architecture in this context? Very powerful stuff. So, how do we, are we in Kansas or are we actually moving? And this is my, my more complicated slides in inverted commas that I was told, are you sure I want to put these in, in production? No, no, let's try it, let's see what, what happens. But what I want to do is the final part. I don't know how much time I've got left with the, with the talking, but um, essentially what we have is really, I would classify probably four different architectural paradigms coming along, there may be others, but this is just four that I've identified. You may be working with clients and, uh, in your own company and thinking about how do I get a better digital experience? You may be thinking about your customer digital products or your asset management through life engineering. How do I get better, smarter objects and asset management? You may be thinking about your connected supply chain ecosystem. Or you may actually be thinking about the whole, whole, whole farm and thinking about how do I create an, in, an integrated value chain ecosystem? I find in a lot of the work I do that I'm getting questions across all of these. And a great phrase from a friend of mine in a well-known world, one of the world's leading drinks companies, he said, I speak to a lot of vendors and architects and people, I say, like you, and I get different views, a bit like the three, you know, the three blind men or whatever trying to describe an elephant. It's, it's big, it's got ears and stuff, but they don't quite know the size of it. And they have a seven or eight level architecture that describes the foot and the leg and the ear. This is the internet of things, but no one will tell them what is the roadmap. How do you build an elephant? Not an elephant the size of an elephant, but the sense of architecting an ec ecosystem thinking mindset because it's got lots of connected products and services. That's the challenge ahead of us, I think. The PA Consulting, this is a slight advert, but it's one of explaining that we have covered a lot of these bases already today. We start to see that through our experience of connected smart systems with these sensors there, we've done things around looking at a digital bank, trying to understand how that is actually going to work as a digital bank that is just digital, not physical. We've done things around security architectures. There was a good question around, you know, what's cyber security in all of this? That's a hobby of mine, by the way. It's a hobby of every architect who spent any time in IT. We we'll always have to have an eye on the security question. I can go on, but what we're finding here is that we're starting to have to think across all of those four areas depending on the priorities of where your business maturity model is today. What's happening is that, I've just put this up because it's because of, the, because of the audience we've got here. We have to start to think about what are the common themes that we should be putting in a, in a reference architecture. What do we need to think about in terms of joining up these spaces? You've got the machine to human interaction that Chris was talking about earlier. But a lot of this stuff, and it's always a good one to wind up the cybersecurity officers, say, well, it's got nothing to do with you because it's all machine to machine connections. You're just, a, you're just an observer. Forget it, it's gone. You, know, you need to bring out the, the, the robot cybersecurity to go chasing after the data. It's not quite like that, am I? But there's things about connected spaces and services and sensors. You've got connection of feeds and speeds and information about the noise effect of that. How do I visualize it? I just want to know the red stuff. I don't want to know every single minutiae thing, just tell me the important things. And how do I get aggregation and connected intelligence? Okay. We have privacy, we have ecosystem standards, we have performance issues that are horizontal across all of those. A lot of the challenges today is how do you have joined up thinking? Just very quickly then, leading in towards the last few slides, I just do want to cover in the remaining seven minutes that I've got. 
if you think about customer experience, it's not actually just about designing the form factor or the UI design, which is obviously you know, eye candy, very useful. There's a couple of things that I've noticed, and we've started to embed this in the discussions we've been doing with the Digital Business and Customer Experience Workgroup. You have to think about ergonomic design. You have to think about usability. My favorite one is I go to my cinema, local cinema, and I've got a QR code. And uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm, I use the QR code to book or check in my, my cinema ticket. And what happens is that uh, it comes up, here we are, right on cue. And of course the scanner is pointing the wrong way, so I end up doing this because I can't get it on the scanner. I look right, idiot. And that's the whole point. It's not designed for the interactivity experience, apart from making it look like a teapot or whatever. <laughs> but it's, that's the whole point. Have they thought about form and function? We don't normally put that in the architecture model, do we? What we do is called agile thinking. It's, called, it's about agency and usability studies. Yeah? Then there's the psychology of this. I mean, some of this is quite sensitive and I can't talk about it, but it, in the sense that you have to think about the psychology of why people use things. What are they doing? Cyber attacks or products that might have a, a brand image problem. How do you change that? We're using digital social influences. I say no more. But it's possible. PCST, Privacy, Confidentiality, Security and Trust. If you actually think about that, they're all orthogonal, but I won't go into that. That's another debate for those who are interested into orthogonality of cyber dimensions, but that's a, another debate for another time. Human factors, I've already explained, but it's about the top one, I'd say the proximity, and then on, the, on your right side, the different types of technologies. You look about embedded technologies, wearables, nanotech. It's really interesting how you design a customer experience. And I would argue this is now advanced customer experience, ACX, not CX. Another one, quickly. Basically, we're now into the situation where, you, and this is just an example of connected finance, the digital wallet. The digital wallet, is it not? A vehicle, a device to connect you to other services. So it's not only knowing that you had a burrito for your breakfast this morning and you can connect with your local retail and, and, and canteen. We can know what your health is. You know, you really should cut down on those burritos. You should be getting out there and do some running. You know, patronize me, patronize me. Give me an in incentive or something or whatever, you know. <laughs> but you can start to see the connected space. You start to create a different kind of mindset in designing services. Socially connected. Sharing economy. New payment models across industry. <coughs> Engineering, industry 4.0. We're finding that we have to start thinking very differently there too. Cross-cutting technologies, you know, this is just things, the connected factory, the intelligent factory. The one I like uh, particularly is in the middle one, advanced engineering, where you have the paperless supply chain. And then you have just in time flexible, configurable production facilities. It's not only flexible in JIT sense of 80, of 80 years ago, of, well, 80 years ago or 30 years ago. You can actually reconfigure the machines depending on the kind of environment and service you want to do. It's like a completely dynamic architecture. It rebuilds itself. What's that about? Additive manufacturing, 3D printing. All these things come together in a way you have to think differently for architecture. So the last couple of things I'd just like to say is we are not in Kansas anymore. We are actually in San Francisco. We are all into thinking about owning digital spaces or owning the digital experiences. We need to think about roadmaps. The one line that I would say that I find I hear time and time again is, how do I join up systems of systems thinking? How do I join up connected spaces? Because there are things now that need to start to be addressed because they are happening now. So that's all I was going to say. Uh, as I said, we've got, uh, this is the, the draft paper that's starting to be technically edited at the moment, I believe, which is really just raising some of the questions that I've raised in the slides about what does it mean to think about digital. Uh, we're going to have a, another session from uh, Huawei later with uh, Trevor Chong, which is, should be very, very interesting about really the roads to, to this um, idea. We're also trying to extend TOGAF. So that's me, uh, that'll put you off. Um, 
I've got a couple of books and stuff like that, but please do ask if you want to sort of learn any more about the things we're trying to do. Um, as I said, you can have these slides, but talk about the demo. Um, this is PA Consulting. Um, we're not a large consulting, but we are a premier consulting in the sense we do all of this stuff and we have track record to prove that this is an issue of today. So I thank you very much for listening to me. I have two minutes on the clock, so I'll take any questions in the remaining two minutes. Thank you. Right. Round of applause for Mark, please. Great presentation. <laughs> Can I invite you to take a seat? Oh, sure, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, Steve's collecting some, uh, some cards. And is someone set up to ask the questions? There's more questions. Lots of questions. Lots and lots of questions. So we'll get them uh, to someone at the back asking questions. No, we can do them from here instead. That's fine too. So well, <laughs> while they gathered up, Mark, um, I was a lawyer in a previous life. And um, even I prefer flattening out to temporal spatial transformation. <laughs> that one is that reassuringly one. complicated. It must yeah, be true. Absolutely. Yes, I know. that one's a that one's a um, a tongue twister. So um, one question I did get from from our table is that when you talk about um, new platforms and products becoming platforms in their own right, the Open Group has a long history with platforms. Um, Unix certification among, among them. Um, do we need to think about the, the first platform and what we've learned from <coughs> platforms in the past when we are developing the third platform? Yeah, I think we have to start thinking about, um, in well, we go back to basics. We talk about abstraction, we talk about encapsulation, we talk about modularity. These are fundamental principles of basic one-on-one -on -one architecture. And I would say these haven't changed, but we just need to think about the modularity is slightly different. So somebody, to answer your question in platform three, which is the connected system, systems thinking, if you will, is you have to then think about um, how do you do federated abstraction? So what you might start to say, well, this is a device. It has an abstraction, which is called the device or the sensor. So the sensor and the device are effectively one of the architecture layers, one of the tiers, if you will. And then I have to think about network. So this is something that would be good to ask Huawei and others around this, is that Part of what I've got in some of my slides is that a lot of this needs a strong investment in telecoms architecture. Because typically what we tend to do, and I just must very briefly, is we say, well, we're architecting the physical environment. You know, we may have SNO, SNO, you know, software divine network. We actually have to think about the network space and the connectivity between those devices. So I think, you know, Steve, in a nutshell, we need to think about the content and the devices in a new type of model that will allow us to talk that language. Right. right. Thank you. I think we've got some questions from the floor that Dave Lounsbury, who you've seen earlier today, um, our CTO at the Open Group, is going to, <laughs> going to ask. Thank you, Steve. Now, we've got quite a few Mark. Uh, so <laughs> So as new services emerge and businesses evolve, do we, new, do we need new values and metrics for figuring out how we succeed in those? Yeah, yeah, I think we need to put um, value on privacy. Uh, I think we need, that works both ways. Privacy is a relative thing. Uh, the value of trust, you know, do we want to invest? Um, I think we also need to put a measure on generativity. It's a bit like um, getting a really, really uh, nerdy comment now. It's about, um, you know, the, the, the Bose-Higgs uh, particle research and about adding mass to particles. It's kind of in that space, you have this energy of the vacuum, if you will, the energy of data. And um, this is kind of an answer you probably weren't expecting, but you have to put a premium or the value of that information because it's not just transactions anymore. The value is not in the transactions, it is in the experience and connected value of the data. Thank you. Why is it important to describe the entire business architecture? In a, in a disintermediated business model, isn't it sufficient to just set the overall principles and constraints and let people work within those? Yeah, I've heard that one a lot. It's, uh, you could say design thinking or outcome-based outcome -based thinking is, is a good method and it is a good method. And it gives flexible ag agility and thinking beneath the system to try and deliver the kind of outcomes. And it doesn't matter, relatively speaking, how it's achieved. 
But actually, when you actually dig under the, the covers of this, and when you actually go into trying to do connected devices like these, or connected engineering systems, where you've got high value, expensive assets, you do have to think about the costs of embedded technology. You do have to start to really understand the design architectural thinking for agility. And I would say I agree with that point to a point, but I think in practice what you start to see practitioners want to know, like Steve's earlier question, what are the lessons we need to have in Platform 3? Because we need to design smart, flexible, modular architectures. I may have just partially answered this one, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, what for you is the most important uh, difficulty for an enterprise to overcome to succeed in a digital transformation? Yeah, I mean, the traditional one that consultants will, will sell you <laughs> um, is, that, oh, it's your culture. You've got to get your skills right. And you might need a psychologist, by the way, because they're good to have on your books. And I think another one is, oh, you need good data analysts because they, they'll give you information about what you don't know and all that stuff. So yeah, to some extent, there is about starting small, scaling quickly. Um, it's about having the right skills in place. Um, the reason this was successful, and I know the team in London who did this, they had a very strong pilot system and it scaled really quickly. So I'd say it is that people side of things, but I would say also I'd like to think that the ingenuity and vision and creativity is something I think, it's not something you can architect and put in a book. You can just say there are things that you want to have the freedom of being able to think in a new way. And I would say, one of the things I would say to any new generation of architects is, be creative. I mean, I worked at Sky TV for a while, and I call it IT on steroids. It's the most stressful job I ever had. Love it a bit. You know, 10 weeks to get something done, and you've got three minutes or three hours to get the first plan done. You're in, sort of thing. It's continuous innovation, and that is a different mindset. So it's all those things, you know, David. Can I just jump in there, Dave? What, one of the slides you showed, Mark, was about um, designing a customer experience. Um, and it struck me it was lots of disciplines might be involved in that. It's not clearly not just a technical thing. Um, it's not just an architecture thing. But what what's what type of disciplines are involved? I mean, you mentioned psychologists and uh, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll use a I'll answer it in a different way. If you look at 3D printing, I was talking to a colleague about the use of additive manufacturing, and he said, well, we've got lots of machines in different factories, and we've got lots of spares. Wouldn't it be a good idea to have a 3D printing facility next to the spares? store and it just prints out a new part to put in the machine. They say, yeah, that's a good idea for 3D printing, additive manufacturing. So you need to have different types of bill of materials experts because you've got to think about things. You said the trouble with the building with the assets we've got today, they're not actually designed to be used to support by additive manufacturing. So they're not reconfigurable. So you need to have a different type of engineering mindset that designs products that are using additive engineering. You see the idea that I'm trying to introduce here. It's having a joined up supply solution set with the agency of what the device is trying to do so we avoid this kind of I built something but I have to break my wrist to actually use it so it's having a joined up um, what we call through life engineering mindset kind of a follow-on to that uh, first person who wrote this uh, thank you for a great talk but uh, the experience the customer goes through of course is personal one as you as you've pointed out and so we see this uh, collision of, of spaces or collaboration of spaces, um, you know, how do you drive a concept of a digital identity that can actually help people move through those spaces? Uh, any thoughts on how that would be developed? Yeah, there's, um, I could shamelessly plug one of my company interests outside of PA, which is just an academic company called the Hub of All Things, which uh, Google it, it's a, an interesting uh, concept. You have to do two things to answer your question. Is you've got to put a value on your identity I mean, I've been, I've been on national TV and international TV talking about the subject. And <coughs> the common theme that we're starting to see is this idea that people are starting to realize that I've opted in or I opted in by accident to give and share my data. So the concept there is you have to understand, is that what we want? You know, do I want to do that? So the idea of identity has to be understood in the context of, you know, you, you hear the Europeans going about the right to be forgotten and things like that, and that's a, a similar analogy around regulation following technology, technology following regulation. But I would say quickly on the other side though, you might want to be discovered. You know, if in a, an extreme form is if you want a car 
that actually is going to get out of the way if you're going to hit something. You want to have a system that understands that particular moment with the right relevant parameters. But equally, something less, less threatening would be to say, I want to have information that is personalized to me. But I become the center of effectively my personal cloud, to use that phrase. And I can start to share information and start to get value trading not in a way that's traditional selling, but actually is integrated so it becomes an augmented experience. See, the different mindset. It's an automation mindset, but not being automated, but being automated agency and support. It's, I'm a positivist, by the way. I always think everything is going to turn out for the good, which is just one of my uh, thoughts. But it, it's that kind of idea that if you create it right, you know, I do generally believe it was in, the, in um, Forbes this, this morning I was reading around uh, the value of um, society and you know, automation, the impact of robots, jobs, and productivity. You know, I think this is a really interesting whole area that you have to understand the impact on society. And I think I see it as a force of good to improve our lives, improve people who need medical attention. Now, I, can, I can give you a long list of reasons what I think is good about what we could do here. See how we're doing our time. I think we're out of time, probably. Okay. You probably have other questions, but Mark, you'll be around if... Yes.